Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the costume, costume plot. plot. I'm Jojo Siu. And I'm Sarah Tim. We're professional designers with a passion for costume design and the performing arts. Our podcast does contain spoilers. Accompanying slideshows for each movie are linked in the episode description. We hope you'll join us every other week as we delve into the wonderful world of costume design in the costume plot. <laughs> And welcome to the costume plot again. Welcome back. What an exciting episode. Let's dive right in. We have a very exciting guest with us today. Um, yeah. She's a friend of mine from FITM, but you may know her from Avengers Endgame. Ever heard of it? <laughs> um, Thor Ragnarok? <laughs> American Horror Story? These are just some of her credits. She's um, a brilliant costume maker and many other things um you may know her from her instagram anachronism in action or as the winner of the her universe fashion show it's kelly sircone Hi. <laughs> welcome kelly happy to be here thank you so much for joining us we are stoked to talk to you what movie have you brought us and our listeners today <laughs> I am super excited to be talking about The Fall, which is probably my favorite movie of all time. And when you guys mentioned it during the Mirror Mirror episode, I was I just got really excited and I messaged I messaged you pretty much like the day later. <laughs> And I was really I excited because, like, you are. I just want to say you're a great get for a podcast guest about about a podcast about costuming because absolutely you're like legit and amazing. But also, I was saying this to you off mic, but everything that I know about the fall, for the most part, I know because of Kelly's posts and her cosplay of it, and I've just been an admirer of the costumes from afar. So I'm excited to deep dive into them today. Absolutely. I'm so glad we're covering this like in a different way, <laughs> even if we don't cover it on our episode normally. Yeah. Well, yeah this so movie glad, has so many so costumes in it. It would it. There's a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. <laughs> Perfect for one episode. <laughs> totally. Yeah, we can really take our time. This is mm -hmm. exciting. <laughs> All right. So I already gave you power to share. So whenever you are oh. ready, Kelly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so should I, I'll just start with talking by talking about the movie a little bit. Yeah. Tell sure. us whatever you feel like we need to know before we get okay. into the close. The fall was directed by Tarsim Singh and costume designed by Aiko Aishioka, which this was the second movie that they collaborated on. The first being The Cell, and then the, the Fall, The Immortals, and Last Mirror Mirror, for which Aiko won her Oscar. Mm -hmm. The movie was loosely based off of a 1981 film uh, called Yo Ho Ho, which was a Bar Bulgarian language film. It was oh. released in 2006 at the Toronto Film Festival and theatrically released in 2008. And it had pretty mixed reviews when it came out i guess a lot of people went to go watch it thinking it would be like a comedy and then were very surprised when it was not <laughs> was yep. it marketed more as a comedy because sometimes it's that's all in the marketing you know True. i i mean i think people just thought it was gonna be like oh a fantasy adventure like you know they weren't expecting it to be as sad as it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The movie was largely funded by Tarsim himself because um, a lot of people were very confused when he tried to explain that he wanted to make a movie that was partially written by a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that he wanted to do, after, because he did the cell because there was so much CGI in it. He really wanted to try and do the opposite of that. So... All of the locations in the film, they're actually, like, on location. And I love it, that. they filmed in, like, 20 mm -hmm. different countries over the course of four years. And wow. he, he said of working with Aiko, uh, we heard Aiko was really difficult to get, but we fell down on our knees. It turned out to not be so hard. She worked on every one of my films. Aw. And... I had enough of that in my first film. As much as I enjoyed it, I decided in this one, the art direction was going to be in the landscape and in the costume design and nothing else. And I feel like you really see that in the cell because it really, 
it really is the setting, the the places that he found, and then the costumes. There's not a lot mm-hmm. of other bells and whistles until it comes to the storytelling. And this movie really is like a love letter to storytelling. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't very popular when it came out, it was very hard to research. I couldn't actually find any quotes from Aiko herself about the movie, um, mm-hmm. which was really mm-hmm. disappointing. We've had a few of those. Sometimes there's just, like, no information to be had, you know? Yeah. I actually feel like I kind of had that with Mirror Mirror, too. Like, she just, there's not a lot she says about her work, because I think she sort of lets it speak for yeah. itself. Oh, I did find so. one quote. This was right before she did Mirror Mirror. She talked about how she wanted to try doing something computer-generated, like Toy Story, but in real life. Whoa. That would have been so cool. Yeah, and she she said that she was actually, like, disappointed that she got so famous for doing costume design because she, I mean, she was a production designer, like, and she had a really mm. long award-winning career as, like, a, a graphic and advertising artist. So once she got really famous yeah. for costumes, like, that's the only thing people wanted to hire her for. Wow, I didn't know that. It makes a lot of sense, like, where that artistic vision comes from because of the graphic design background. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can see a lot of that translation. That's so cool, though. Uh, because this movie is kind of hard to explain, I'm just going to read <laughs> a plot synopsis because I feel like if we go costume to costume, it it's going to be bonkers. You'll miss a, a lot because a lot, <laughs> like, a lot lost. about this movie is it's like playing with archetypes, like storytelling archetypes. So a lot of the characters are those archetypes, but they're also, it's kind of like the Wizard of Oz where it's, double cast so you'll see the real life person that character in the story that's being told shows up as so in 1915 los angeles heartbroken stuntman roy walker is hospitalized and possibly paralyzed after taking a jump in his first film he meets alexandria a young romanian born patient in the hospital who is recovering from a broken arm and begins to tell her a story about her namesake alexander the great Alexandria is told she has to leave, but Roy promises to tell her an epic tale if she returns the next day. The next morning, as Roy spins his tale of fantasy, Alexandria's imagined brings his characters to life. Roy's tale is about five heroes, a silent Indian warrior, an ex-slave, an Italian explosive expert, Charles Darwin, a pet monkey named Wallace, and a masked swashbuckling bandit. An evil ruler named Governor Odious has committed an offense against each of the five who will seek revenge. The heroes are later joined by a sixth hero, a mystic. It quickly becomes apparent, however, Roy has an ulterior motive for telling the story. He wants to gain Alexandria's trust so he can get her to steal medicine for him that he can use to commit suicide. I feel like this entire movie needs to have a trigger warning for suicide. Yes, because yes. Absolutely. It is it is like riddled like throughout the movie from like Roy's depression and suicide ideation when he actually attempts to commit suicide and some of the other characters also commit like sort of suicide in different scenarios later on towards the end and there's also a, child abuse, child manipulation and child death. Mm-hmm. Like there are parts of this movie that are really intense and they kind of sneak up on you. So mm-hmm. for anyone who wants to skip the the more emotional part of it, I would stop at the one hour and two minute mark or when Roy asks Alexandria if she likes chocolate. <laughs> it's a good marker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I looked it up because I like the movie. It It's so like pretty and fun. And then it just takes a mm-hmm. hard turn. <laughs> And if you're not <laughs> yeah. expecting it, it it can be a lot. Okay, so getting to the actual costumes now. <laughs> Woohoo! This is Alexandria, and she spends the whole movie in this cast, which is really cute because she's always like walking around carrying this box that has all of her special things in it, and mm-hmm. a lot of the items in it show up in different ways throughout the movie. She, mm-hmm. I know you guys like a good sweater, and she has a really cute sweater. <laughs> we do. She, she knows. <laughs> she loves it. Oh see, like, it has this nice little detailing down the side and at the Ooh. hem. Oh, so cute. And I think it's supposed to be winter in Los Angeles. Like, they're definitely in, in, in L.A., but 
Mm-hmm. I think it's supposed to be winter because otherwise, like, you would be way too warm to wear a sweater. <laughs> so, like, a breezy yeah. 65, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she spends most of the movie in various sort of dressing gowns, and they usually have, like, a little bit of lace around the collar and sometimes, like, some pin tucking. And they're just, they're super cute. She's adorable. She is adorable. <laughs> I love how she's wearing this sweater around her cast, too. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, it's like it, under her pit. Sleep. it wouldn't fit. Like, it wouldn't fit otherwise. Right. 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 <laughs> so cute. And here's Roy. And you pretty much only see him in this shirt. And then later on, another sweater. Like, he basically, in, like, the real world, he wears the same outfit the whole time. And you never see him from the waist down, which Mm -hmm. I I think was to sort of help sell that he was paralyzed. And I guess when they were filming, they didn't tell her that he could walk. Like, she actually thought that he was paralyzed. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, They went really above and beyond to try and get like, a very authentic response from her. Like, I guess, uh, like, even she didn't necessarily have lines. Uh, Lee Pays, who plays Roy, would say his dialogue, and then she would respond, like, improv, respond, and then he would play Mm -hmm. along with her. So a lot of the dialogue in the movie, she made up on the spot. And she didn't speak English, so a lot of her, like, you're actually watching her, like, learn and speak English in over the course of the film. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. I had heard that. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you can tell too, like, because you can, when she's speaking, you can kind of see that she's like trying to figure out how to phrase a question. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, his shirt, I did notice compared to some of the other characters that you see later on that are wearing more like modern shirts, he's actually wearing a slightly like pioneer, what feels to me like a sort of pioneery. Sure, mm-hmm. and I wondered if that was a nod to the fact that he's a stuntman in westerns, and mm-hmm. maybe this is more what he's comfortable wearing because he's he's usually wearing something like this in a film. Interesting. And all of the textiles yeah. in the hospital are are very worn in. You know, they've probably been washed a million times. They look very soft. And here is the two of them in bed because they they spend pretty much the whole time storytelling. In various snuggly positions, mm-hmm. t- <laughs> talking back and forth to each other. Mm-hmm. I did notice when I was watching it last night, um, I was like, wow, her, she's such a good actress. And, you know, like ch- children are not always really good actors. So true. I was definitely yeah. impressed by her. And it, it makes sense why it feels so natural. It's because it was. It was because... Right. She was being really natural. That's so awesome. Yeah, and the curtain that was around his bed, I guess sometimes they would cut holes in the curtain and film through the hole so Ooh. that it was just like sort of the two of them interacting. Mm-hmm. One thing that's worth noting uh, when you're watching the story unfold in this movie, Roy is the narrator. Like, you're always hearing him speaking, but what you're actually seeing is from Alexandria's imagination. So there ends up being some kind of, like, funny visual dialogue jokes because they're clearly thinking of different things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So. That was really a, a fun part of the movie that I remember. I think they did that really well. Oh, and I was, this is maybe more for later, but because stuntmen are really important in this film, I wanted to show you guys this photo of the stuntmen yes. who played all of the main characters. Uh, Shout out, that's stuntmen. so great. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, first up is the bandit. Now, this three different characters wear this costume over the course of the film. The first person we see wearing it is Alexandria's father, and this is when Roy has decided to make him this character in her story. And he starts talking about him being one of the the two brothers, the bandit brothers. Later. Roy takes over that role when it becomes clear that Alexandria like either doesn't understand what he's trying to do or doesn't want her father in the story. So Roy takes on the role of the bandit. And then finally, Mm -hmm. towards the end of the movie, 
uh, Alexandria inserts herself into the narrative and she becomes the bandit's daughter. Like she literally shows up and it's like, it's me, your long lost daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the two of them here. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's so cute. Look it's, at that. It's, it's so cute. I very distinctly remember when I watched this movie, like when she comes out with her little red mask, I was just like, yay. <laughs> Everything is cuter when you make it small. It's true. And she and she's so cute. Like I think she like does she like tips her little mask up like see it's me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um this costume it's first they start out by saying that he's Spanish and later they the bandit is switched to being French. So there's there's l- like some sort of mishmashing of elements happening in his costume. But notable is the overly wide suede chaps and i think that's kind of a nod to him you know obviously a bandit is riding a horse and stealing stuff um Mm -hmm. but they're very over the top right Mm -hmm. there's a lot of very subtle texture like in this his robe is a silk habo tie and the mask Mm. that they all wear is like a raw silk and his belt has a lot of tooling on it. And the braid is also, I mean, it has a very decorative pattern when you zoom in on it. And for how, like, decorative his costume is, like, it's, I mean, it's silk. Like, you don't think of a bandit wearing a silk outfit riding a horse. But it's still, it's very functional. Like, you see him mm-hmm. fighting mm-hmm. and swashbuckling on this costume throughout the whole movie. And it it, it moves really beautifully. Yes, yeah. it does. A silk Absolutely. can really be, I think people associate silk with being like really fragile and like it's, you know. It's super strong. People associate sh- charmeuse mm-hmm. and chiffon and floaty and light, but it, it is really strong. It can be a real workhorse fabric. Yeah, definitely. Next up is this slave, Ota Benga. Um, and the name that they gave him, I feel is it, it was a very intentional choice. This is something that Roy probably would have been aware of than why he chose this name. Because uh, he's based off, or not based off of, but Otavanga is the real last name of a real life enslaved man who oh. was put on display in the Bronx Zoo in 1906. So Roy oh, probably yeah, would wow. have heard about this in the news and maybe mm-hmm. that's why he chose the name. Um, I also feel that he was an intentional choice because the real life Otavanga died by suicide. So Mm. I think the Mm. director, you know, wanted to pay homage to him and also just thought that it tied in with the themes of the movie. Uh, Otavanga, he broke out of his chains when Governor Odious killed his brother. So his headdress, I actually found some photos from the craftsperson who made the headdress, Adam Howarth, and he said that the beaded headdress was made from iron iron pyrite or fool's gold Ooh. and the re- the horns are Ooh. resin i tried to see if they were from any specific animal and the closest i could find was a a shimitar oryx hmm. Ooh. it's a beautiful shape i love yeah. it and pattern. The beading is also on the belt of his costume, along with some fur and some more suede. He's... This is his real life counterpart. Uh, he is, is an ice delivery man to the hospital, and like he teases Alexandria because she comes and tries to eat some of the ice. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that his <laughs> he's wearing a, ha- a like his hat is gray. In both worlds. And Mm -hmm. he's wearing a little shawl here, which sort of comes back later. So I'm just pointing it out. But Mm -hmm. I I like that they have these shots of him with a cart in both versions of the story. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of parallels. I had a whole watching that last night with the ice delivery. I had a whole like mental journey. I went on thinking about ice deliveries and how it used to be something that was like part of people's everyday lives and how wild that is. (laughs) Yeah, that and like, like milk delivery. <laughs> yeah, there is a man who came and brought you the ice. Anyway, <laughs> blew my mind a little bit. Next up is Luigi, and he is very stylish and tailored compared to everyone else. He has 
this long mustard cloak with little red lining that's visible periodically. And the back of the coat has this really beautiful raised um, mm -hmm. embroidery applique. And I love the neckline and, or the collar and the cuffs of his coat. It's these like oh. circular pieces that have it's a lot beautiful. of movement, like when he's, you know, pointing his gun or running around. And I've never seen that sort of like cuff before and it looks so cool. Yeah, I, I was trying to like find if there was any historical reference for it. And the closest I could come up to is in the 17th century. Like sometimes you saw those kind of overly circular shapes on like shoe pieces. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, it, it could not be that. And I, <laughs> right. <laughs> Closest. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, spoilers, but in his death scene, he opens up his coat and it has pockets. Pockets. <laughs> pockets. All full the pockets. Of dynamite. And I also know, like, he has what you think is a shirt is actually like an asymmetrical vest that's open on one side. Look at that. Like, that's he's, his shoulder and, like, goes down to boob. his stomach. I yeah. Know, I was just thinking that it's almost like a halter top. <laughs> It's just really unexpected. It's it, like the most the most buttoned up covered character, like when he's like, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Secretly um, sexy inside. Mm -hmm. Yum. And this is his real life counterpart, uh, which is a friend of Roy's and a fellow stuntman who has a prosthetic leg that shows up in various symbolic forms throughout the movie. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I also like this photo because it shows that his real life counterpart is also more tailored than some of the other characters we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like he, he's also wearing a nice suit, and nice shoes. Tied together mm -hmm. like the fantasy and real world versions. Yeah. Next, we have the, the Indian. And he's a really good example of how Roy and Alexandria are interpreting the story differently because it's clear from the phrasing that Roy used that he's referring to a Native American. Um, but Alexandria is picturing her friend from the Orange Groves who is an Indian immigrant from India. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it becomes a bit of a joke. Right. And his costume is beautiful. It... The Ooh. outer sh the outer shell yeah. is an emerald green organza that there's a lot Oof. of pleating in the skirt and in the stylized turban. And it's worn over an underlayer that's sort of a, a rust, maybe cotton or linen. And um, mm -hmm. at one point he he rips, he like pulls out a piece or rips off a piece to make into a blindfold because after the death of his squaw, he made a vow never to look upon another woman. Mm hmm. And uh, the reason that his wife died was because of Governor Odious, which is why he wants to kill her. Right. Mm -hmm. It's actually really, really sad. <laughs> he, Governor Odious, furthering the theme of suicide throughout the movie, Governor Odious kidnapped his wife. And when she wouldn't, I guess, love him, he put her in an, a maze that has no escape except to jump off of a tower and kill yourself. Ugh. That's mm -hmm. so dark. Yeah. Oh. Trigger warning number like 20 at this point. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I love that sheer green over the rust. That's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah it's That's one of my favorite color greens, too. That like emerald color. Oh, it's so gorgeous. Love. Yeah. And I, 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 I mean, I have to think it was intentional, but his beard... I love his beard. It always looks sort of styled, like they they got it to go in the different directions. And when he takes off his turban later in the movie, he has this gorgeous long hair that you're just not really expecting mm -hmm. to have been tucked up in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. Next, we have the naturalist, Charles Darwin. This and coat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... Again, I, 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 Adam Howarth was one of the craftspeople who worked on it, and he said that the coat, the reference for a coat was a highly magnified photo of a butterfly's wing, and that the shape was made with foam, and that the fur was hand-colored. Wow. <gasps> oh, my gosh. 
Wait, so like underneath there is foam? Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, like to get it to have that's that a, very that really structured cool. shape and to st- hold away from his body. Mm-hmm. Wow. Even the arms. Yeah, are the yeah. sleeves the foam too? beautiful. Uh, maybe I, I it it didn't specify. There might be some in there. Yeah, it looks like, like it just is. the way it's kind of holding up. Yeah, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and here is well, here's Wallace who spends most of the film <laughs> being carried around in the little the little bag. Uh, under the coat, he is wearing a white shirt and pants, which his real life counterpart is a hospital orderly, and he's. Pretty mm-hmm. much wearing the same outfit. Like, this is what Alexandria sees him wearing on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And to remind the audience that he's British, I guess, they put him in a, a bowler hat and jack boots, <laughs> which makes it makes it, it makes a very nice look with the, the coat. Like, I'm not I'm not mocking it. It's just funny. Yeah. <laughs> it looks a little bit um, clockwork orangey, too. I was mm-hmm. I was thinking that, but I don't. I don't think that was what they wanted because, like, Darwin right. is so not edgy. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> I guess it's just like the white outfit with the black bowler. Yeah, like yeah, that's no, that's like automatically it calls it to mind. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, the second he takes the coat off, you're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Throwback. <laughs> I've never seen Clockwork Orange, by the way. I don't think I need to. It I'm was okay. a pretty disturbing movie. Yeah. I watched it once and I was like, mm, I don't need to see that again. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it is like really pretty, though. Like the production di- design on that movie is so good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Beautifully done, but hard to watch. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um. So next is the mystic. And he's sort of a combination of two characters. The the other orange picker that Alexandria is a, fr- is a friend with. And then uh, Otto, who is an old man who is in the hospital. And he sort of, he comforts her at various points in the movie when she's afraid. And he makes jokes about having magic teeth and like how to make monsters go away by saying oogly googly. <laughs> so she sort of combines these two characters into... You know, a magic man who can kind of do a little bit of everything. And they meet him when he literally comes out of a tree. Like, I, I forget if it if it's like hit by lightning or just spontaneously bursts into flame. But he like crawls out of it and his his hair like are like part of the tree and sort of like scrambles out like roots. And he slowly mm-hmm. becomes sort of more human looking throughout the movie. Uh, since they're all trying to find Governor Odious, he, I mean, he, he eats Darwin's map, which is poisonous. So then he goes to his friends and they do a ritual to make the directions to Governor Odious show up on his skin. So his skin becomes the map. Cool. And the mm. ritual that they do is based off of a real life, uh, chant called the Kachak and it's a Balinese Hindu dance that is part of Ramayana and is traditionally per- performed uh, in temples. The, mm. the checkered robes that they're wearing is actually part of the ritual so I like that they included that in the movie yeah. even though they're using this ritual in a very non-traditional way. Mm-hmm. That's nice, like a little... That's so fascinating. Yeah, like a little nod to the real life thing. That's cool. I'm trying to remember now, because like my my family went and saw um, like an original Balinese temple dance, but I, I assume it was not the same thing because they weren't wearing exactly this, but a lot of the movements now are making me try and remember if they did anything similar when I watched it. But it's so fascinating, though. Yeah, well, I mean, this they're bringing I, that in. from what I read, it's... It's like part of a specific story that it's like mm-hmm. part of telling the story. So, I mean, maybe they don't perform it outside of telling that story. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So Governor Odious's soldiers are Ooh. based off of, at one point in the movie, Alexandria sees a man doing x-rays 
and it mm. really, really scares her. So the soldiers become mm-hmm. like the nightmare version of the 1920s x-ray outfit, which is a leather apron with a metal breastplate and helmet. And they take that oh. and they they sort of really de- dehumanize it by blacking out the face and the eyes. And they like take like they take away their hands, like they take away features that mm. make them recognizable as humans. Right. And the they sort of like move in a pack in the movie, like they have very stylish movements and all of the noises they make are hyenas. <gasps> so they're like cackling. Now I remember that. <laughs> so creepy. Wow. That's that's extremely creepy. I feel like I should explain to the listeners that I tapped out at like the 40 minute mark of this movie, but I <laughs> definitely intend to go back. I've had a long week and I was like, I can't pay attention to this tonight. <laughs> it deserves Save it my for attention. another day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So some of these are a surprise to me and some are not. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine as a four year old <laughs> there. I mean, they're definitely like they're not in a ton of scenes. But yeah. they're, I mean, they're just so beautiful in a creepy mm-hmm. way. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. They creepy look, to a four-year-old, but really beautiful for us. <laughs> the yeah. helmet almost, it looks almost like, I don't know, like a kitchen appliance or something, but like a very mm-hmm. evil one. And almost like it's like, like a, formed like a to the head. Like a grinder or like a pepper grinder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A blender. Like a deformed one that's gotten kind of crushed in. I just went to Ikea today. Maybe I just have like home furnishings on my brain. The gloves are very so fascinating. creepy. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they have spoons for hands. That's how I draw my hands because I can't draw hands. <laughs> so I just draw like a little diamond shape. A little spoon or spade. <laughs> it's just kind of like this. <laughs> oh, very creepy. Uh, so next up is Governor Odious. Um, mm. So... Part of what is feeding into Roy's depression is uh, the movie that he was in. He was dating the lead actress in the film and she breaks up with him and starts dating the lead actor in the film, who is Sinclair. So Sinclair takes on the role of Governor Odious in the story because Roy really hates him and Alexandria picks up on that. So in real life, Mm -hmm. he's wearing a striped suit jacket, which is very warm and kind of soft looking and stylish white pants. And then the story counterpart of him, he's wearing also a striped coat, but it's very shiny and slick and colorful. And it's just a little over the top. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if they like he ends up dying in a pool. And I don't know if that was meant to be a Great Gatsby reference or not. But, I mean, it is the 19, like, he's very 1920s. I feel like 1920s man dying in a pool is, you can't help but think of Great Gatsby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. I like that fabric. Striped Mm -hmm. fabric. Yeah, and his vest. It's a really nice color. Like, I don't know, it's very hard to see, but it does, this vest also has stripes. Mmm. Love it. It's beautiful. Uh, so. Kind of a nice play of textures. Mm Mm-hmm. So after they have the map, they, they're they trying to find Governor Odious, and they come upon this big wagon, and they think he's inside, but they open it up, and surprise, it's actually Evelyn. And Evelyn is a very complicated character because she embodies a lot of the heartbreak and mixed feelings that Roy is having about his girlfriend, And she's played by Nurse Evelyn, uh, or Sister Evelyn, who is a nun who works in the hospital. So she has, you first see her in her cute little nun outfit, nurse outfit, which is very starched and clean. And you only see Roy's ex-girlfriend for a second, and she's wearing a very simple, like, linen sort of, like, driving suit. Like, when you... I think of, like, pictures of, like, Edwardian wear, ladies wearing driving suits mm-hmm. with, like, the big cats. But she has hair that is a little more 1930s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when she appears in the story as Princess Evelyn, <gasps> she's wearing oh, this... Oh, my favorite. ...beautiful <laughs> gown. There it is. It's so beautiful. I... This costume is very... Chinese inspired from the reference pictures mm-hmm. that I looked up. I 
I'm going to guess that it was from inspired by the Ming Dynasty specifically. And mm. then it has very stylized lotus embroidery down the front and these bands that they're sort of like when you when you look closely they're not completely attached like they're kind of floating on the surface of the sleeves like to make this yeah just her her sleeves very structured and a focal point and she has this very elaborate hat with a a sail of vans that then open oh that's so cool Mm -hmm. and surprise she has like pants underneath i think <gasps> mm-hmm. beautiful and functional oh no wait As no that's your sleeves be. i'm wrong oh jk <laughs> <laughs> i take it back <laughs> well this scene this scene is funny because i oh no wait you didn't get that far but <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> she's like, Roy, like he's t- roy's telling this story right and he can tell that alexandria has to go pee but, like, Ev- Evelyn is, like, acting out that she has to go to the bathroom as she's talking to him. And it's just, it's so funny. Okay, yes. Um, that's hilarious. <laughs> you must watch the second half of this movie soon, I know, last Sarah. time when I was turning it off, I was like, Kelly's going to beat me up. <laughs> uh, well, now you'll just have a greater appreciation when you watch it. It's true. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> you my catch thoughts all exactly. the little little trips. So next, uh, Alexandria has decided that she wants romance in the movie or in the story. So she sort of pushes Roy to make this a romantic love interest, and we see Evelyn in this like very, very over the top, like sort of fairy princess. And there's a corseted bodice, so I'm like, maybe it's a little bodice ripper, although she's pro- way too young to know what that is. But th- <laughs> I mean, this just screams like romantic heroine. And mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the she has a line about how feeling like, I was like a bird in a cage. And then there, there's like music playing and Alexandria is singing her lines. So, <laughs> and then she literally has birds. So like, the, it's kind of like... <laughs> Because she, you find out she was betrothed to Governor Odious, and she's like, oh, I've been rescued now by this bandit, and he loves me. So, you know, this is their, their great moment here. Classic romance novel sort of story. <laughs> yeah. And her locket that she's wearing is the same locket that Roy gave his girlfriend in real life. So mm-hmm. a lot of his, like, he's having a lot of feels in this scene and he's taking them out on her, even though, I mean, it's really his feelings about his ex-girlfriend. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I was tracked down the pattern maker, the woman who originally made this costume. Uh, her name is Jane Law and she has some pictures on her website and surprise, the costume apparently originally had sleeves. Uh I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, but they're, ne- they're never in the movie. So I think they must have just decided they didn't want to use them for whatever reason. And I found another picture of the same costume in a museum. And there it only had one sleeve. Hmm. Only one sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. That's odd. It's like seeing all the different options of what you could and couldn't do with this dress. Yeah, but I mean, I love I love this costume. It's my it's my favorite costume. And I mean, I just love, like, when you zoom in on the bodice, there's all of this texture from this lace that was clearly hand-painted and just very lovingly applied Mm -hmm. everywhere. This is the one you've made. Yeah, or the one I cosplayed. I didn't make this one, but I made a cosplay of it, yeah. Mm. Right, 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 right. Yes. Yeah, like, I pretty much watched this movie and then instantly lost my mind. (laughs) (laughs) It makes sense. We all have those moments. Mm -hmm. So... Especially with how beautiful these costumes are. Um, Oh, I forgot to show you earlier. uh, But when on the anniversary of of Aiko's birthday, the year after she passed away, uh, Google did a Google doodle of her and the costumes they did were from the fall. So these were the three little Google doodles that they did. So it's Evelyn's lotus dress, Luigi's coat, and then... Her wedding dress, which I will show you in a minute. That's so cool. So exciting. What a nice little tribute. Yeah. So, yeah, after... Somebody at Google has taste. After their little love (laughs) fest, they decide to get married. And I love that each of the the characters, they get, like, slightly more dressed up. 
So Otabanga puts on a orange, uh, like iridescent orange robe. The Indian puts on a little jeweled brooch on his turban. <laughs> and the mystic puts on gold <laughs> face paint. Just a little gussy. Yeah, up. I, it's, it's, Small. Just, it's very simple, but Small I thought choices. it was cute. You know, they made an effort for their friend. <laughs> and the scene is very surreal because at this point, Roy has taken what he thinks is like a whole bottle of morphine. So he's kind of tripping out and is spinning. And then they're surrounded by Sufis, who like Sufi dancers who are doing a meditative mm. dance. And it's, it's very surreal and beautiful. I love the big skirts. And can you just explain to us what the Sufi dancers are for our audience members who might not know what that is? I don't um, know. I was <laughs> nodding like I knew, but I don't know. Oh, God, where's my note? Uh, I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you no, on the spot fine. there. Because I, I realized I was like, oh, I don't think I know what that is. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew I wouldn't remember everything, so I tried to take notes. Totally fine. It is a meditative practice for a certain branch of Islam. So they, oh. so they ah, will, gotcha. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's a ritual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Thank you. I'm sure. I'm sure we would have one person out there asking that at some point. Yeah. Well, I'm sure in this. <laughs> so now we I know. Mean, in this movie, it's probably very stylized and not how it is in real mm-hmm. life. Um, I would assume because right. I feel like I have seen yeah. videos of Sufi dancers before, and it has not been like this. And one thing <laughs> yeah. that I. One thought that I had about the colors of their outfits, which I will come back to you after we talk about her wedding dress, but I think that this color choice of the white over the blue was intentional. Mm -hmm. So this is Evelyn's wedding dress. And as you can see, it is just so beautiful. Amazing. (laughs) It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It has sleeves similar to her lotus dress but they're much more structured like they're almost padded or I think they are padded or mm -hmm. quilted uh with rolls and the fabric is like a very 3d jacquard like you it may be even trapunto like here on the sleeves you can see that there's these raised portions and it's yeah it has sleeves like her lotus dress but it's much more fitted and even has like a bustle in the back like these back these pleats fan out over over something doing support here and i see maybe like an outline of a hoop Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah and i mean her headdress is just like amazing oh it's just phenomenal this film has a lot of use of veils and masks as i'm sure you've seen Uh, Which I can only assume is Mm -hmm. symbolic of, like, hiding one's true feelings and emotions and motivations, since there's a lot of uh, duplicitousness in this movie. Yeah. The padded rolls remind me sort of of kimonos. Mm. We had Mm -hmm. to make one for um, M. Butterfly, and we have to, like, roll up a whole thing of batting, you know, for the hem. It's like this padded yeah. roll sort of well, look. I mean, you can mm-hmm. kind of see, like, it does look at, like it is also padded mm-hmm. at the hem, like... You mm-hmm. can see kind of a little yeah. roll down there. Yep. It's a cool effect. I think a lot of the kimonos have that layered sleeve look too. So it kind of, it, it's re- very reminiscent yeah. of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure, I mean, she, Aiko is Japanese. Like, I'm sure even if she wasn't right, consciously right. thinking of that, it was in, in her yeah. design aesthetic, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So going back to the Sufis for a second, when I was looking, also looking at her sleeves, it kind of made me think of like, a bed comforter which then (laughs) sent me down this like Mm -hmm. thought train of like oh well like maybe the white over the blue is supposed to be symbolic of like the weight of his relationship and like heartbreak is smothering him like like a like a too big blanket Mm. it might be a stretch (laughs) but i was like "Hmm," you know just like late night thoughts (laughs) (laughs) we like while you're in bed that's it makes sense. Cool. I can I can see that connection there. <laughs> Even if it's not something that like was intended by the filmmakers, it's fun to sort of find those little maybe symbolic things that you can read into as a viewer. Yeah. And this movie leaves. Mm-hmm. I mean, this movie has so many things in it that you could take symbolism from. And I'm sure there's even more like because I'm watching this as 
a Western person and the director mm-hmm. is Indian. And I'm sure there's a lot of like cultural references right. in here that I'm not picking up on. Right. And that, that a lot of people have actually like pointed that out is that there's so many there's so much interplay of different points of view, like from Roy and Alexandria. And then mm-hmm. that it when you talk about the this movie being about a love letter st- of storytelling, it's sort of also the collaborative process of storytelling because the story changes so much over yeah. the course of the movie based off the, the different points of view. And I love it. I love that's that. A very, I think that's a very non-Western trope as well of storytelling because we talk about passing stories down mm-hmm. through generations. And I think that also carries through this movie very, very well. Um, not just from his perspective, but also from Iko's perspective, too. I think just having all those different layers, there's so much symbolism and kind of religious mysticism that's a very big part of uh, Eastern culture and Eastern um sensibilities that I think definitely shows up in this yeah. movie. So I think that's yeah, it's a great point. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. I mean there there this is kind of like the last like big costume. Like there are a few like minor things after this, but I mean really after this, like it's kind of like a cartoon where a lot of the characters stay in the same costume the whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I I think this touches on so much of what's in there, though. (laughs) This gives us a really good like smattering of all the characters and how we see each of them in the real life and also the the fantasy element. I think that parallel is really fun to see. And what a great challenge for a costume designer to be able to kind of come up with two very distinct, but they need to tie together looks. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And I guess. Oh, yeah. Again, I just I just thought of this right now, like. She's wearing a very structured white hat, and when she's a nun, she's also wearing a very structured white hat. <laughs> There's mm-hmm, just so many mm-hmm. parallels. I love it. Yeah. Aiko really thinks of everything, like, in all she, of her movies. Really, That's all really I've does. ever seen. And, I mean, this this movie, like, this like this movie had a $30 million budget. That's nothing. Like, like it's, it's crazy. Just, it's saying that they made this movie with so little money. Like, I know $30 million <laughs> sounds like a lot, but it's not for a giant movie. Not for a movie with this Especially much with all those locations, yeah. too. Like, <laughs> it's insane. Well, it's like we were talking about earlier, the triangle of cheap, fast, and good. <laughs> they picked cheap and good, and it took them four years. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It took them a very long time, but it was worth oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> Correct decision. <laughs> Yeah, very, very true. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This is so much fun. It was nice to kind of revisit the the costumes, especially since I hadn't seen it in so long. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's what happens in this movie. But yes, it was fun to see all of them again and all the characters again and kind of be reminded of what happened. Yeah, I was I, I mean, I was so happy to like have a chance to really like dig in and research this movie because I learned even more about it and it just made me love it more to like to hear about all of the like behind the scenes work that went into it like what I actually managed to find made me just love it even more right yeah that's Mm -hmm. half the fun of making this podcast is like the research part I I know that I have had such a good time like especially if it's like one of my favorite movies you know like finding out all these tidbits that I didn't know before and it just deepens your appreciation for it and especially like not even just like as a film, but it makes you appreciate the craftspeople who who put their yeah. work into it and made it what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they um for sure because they shot in so many different countries. Like they hired a lot of times it was local crew. So like when I was looking mm-hmm. at the costume crew, it would be like uh, seamstress India, seamstress Italy. Like it it was really like mm-hmm. they pulled from a huge talent pool to make this movie happen. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I feel like that adds so much more of that authenticity to the process too. Like knowing that you're not just getting one team working on everything. Not saying that they can't make it beautiful, but like you're getting a little bit from every country and seeing some of that sensibility yeah. based on that seamstress or that team or whatever is going to, whoever is going to be working yeah. on and that. And I mean, that totally. ties back into like the, one of the themes of the movie of like, like collaboration and different points of view. Like you're actually getting... Mm-hmm input from all of these different people from all of these different countries yes yeah yes completely well great job thank you <laughs> i know <laughs> yay for all the prep that was prep work. expertly done thank you 
Um, <laughs> it was. So do you want to tell so our listeners a little bit about um, maybe like what you do in, you know, the entertainment in- industry? What what do you do, Kelly? Uh, yeah. So I am <laughs> a member of the Motion Picture Costumers uh, Local 705, and I am a table person which uh, is sort of the equivalent of a first hand for people who are in theater and know what that means. Um, but on a daily basis, I will assist the cutter fitter or pattern maker with basically whatever they need help with, whether that's like finishing patterns or cutting out fabric, stitching, sort of like organizing, prioritizing projects. I mean, I'm, I'm essentially an assistant to the cutter fitter. Right. Very cool. That's kind of what I do in theater. So it's funny that we sort of like are parallel, but in different industries. (laughs) Um, So what have been some of your favorite projects? You could say like some of your favorite films you've worked on or even like favorite pieces like that Um, you're really proud of having a hand in. Oh, man. And there's just so there's so many. I mean, I I was like over the moon when I got to work on The Mandalorian because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And yeah, I mean, yeah. I was like, I was like, when I found out that they were going to be filming it in Los Angeles, I was like snooping hardcore, like to try and get <laughs> any information so that I could like get on that show. And then I was working on Avatar and we were like walking around the studio and I looked over and I saw like a poster with Boba Fett's face on it. And I was like, they're filming it here. And literally it was like, it was like two, two stages over. Oh my God. You're like, I'm just going to walk in and pretend like I already work there. Yeah, um, (laughs) Just show up and sit down and start working. I've been here the whole time. I'm sewing this thing. What are you talking about? What do you mean? You don't know who I am. (laughs) That's rad. Yeah. That is pretty awesome. No, that was Very great. Cool. And I mean, like we're all the like all the Marvel films that I worked on have been really great. Yeah, I mean, there was one pilot that I worked on that we got to make so many amazing costumes, and the pilot never came out. <laughs> it just makes me <gasps> sad every time I think about it. But I mean, that just happens. Like, I mean, most, it does. Like, yeah. It, I don't even know what the ratio is of like pilots that get canned versus like into shows, but I mean, it happens. But oh, what man, was it called? Some, uh, it was called Hieroglyph, and it was going to be, like, the Egyptian version of Game of Thrones. That sounds fascinating. excellent. I would watch that. That makes me <laughs> yeah, sad I that it never watch. went anywhere. There, the trailer used to be up on Hulu. I don't know if it still is, but it was for a while, mm-hmm. which uh, surprised me. I was oh, like, why, you, why did you put out the trailer if you're never going to make the show? But okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm still happy to see it. Trailers are for advertising <laughs> things. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so sad. Well, I I assume that the costumes you made for them are hopefully like hopefully they'll be used for something else. Lovely, right? Yeah, I mean I don't know. Like they I don't don't know where they ended up. Like they could be mm-hmm. in a rental house somewhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't tell me these things. They don't yeah. tell me. <laughs> they just disappear. I never see them again. <laughs> So what brought you to costuming? Do you have like a specific experience in your life or did you always know that it was something you wanted to do? Uh, I think I I always knew that it was something I wanted to do or I knew I wanted to do something sewing related. Like I remember my mom telling me that when I was like six or seven, I like we were in like the car going somewhere and she turns to me and she's like, or I turned to her and apparently proclaimed that I was going to become a corset maker one day. And she was like, okay, honey, that's, that's fine. That's great. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. Which, sure I mean, enough. I did. I became a corset maker. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it didn't really, it stupidly didn't really occur to me until I was like in high school and saw the Lord of the Rings movies. I was like, oh, right. This is like a job job. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I had a brief stint in high, in high school where I was like, oh, or no, I would say like in junior high where I was like, oh, maybe I'll become a marine biologist. And then it was like, no, I want to make costumes. I feel, is it weird? I think to, I had that in ninth grade too. I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. Is it weird to <laughs> also, th- I, th- I know a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I had a marine biologist phase. Like everybody has a phase like that when they're a kid, when they're like, the ocean is rad. I'm going to be a marine biologist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like grew up watching I mean, National Geographic. It's glorious. 
So fascinated. The ocean is fascinating. It's you scary. don't know what's in there. It's magical. <laughs> it's funny because I actually met a marine biologist and she's like, I had literally the opposite experience. She was like, I was in school and I thought I was going to become a costumer and then I became a marine biologist. Oh my God. <laughs> How funny. When do you ever hear that? <laughs> You're like, did we Freaky Friday at some point? <laughs> <laughs> and just never switch back. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so like. funny. Wow. That's so funny. That's hilarious. So how, um, if you don't mind me asking, how did you kind of first get into, you know, costuming for movies? I know you said you went to fit them with Sarah, but what was your kind of first transition into, um, into movies? Well, I, while I was still in school, I interned for a local stylist, uh, Mildred of Mother of London, and uh, a lot of, like, she had a clothing line, but she would also do, like, custom pieces for a lot of musicians. And then mm-hmm. that sort of, like, rolled into making costumes for uh, small independent movies. And once I graduated, I mean, not immediately, but, like, because you have to get 30 days to join the union. And it took mm-hmm. me a while to get 30 days. Um, But I was working at a a local costume house uh, off and on and Mm -hmm. kind of just like I think my first actually hieroglyph was the first big pilot that I worked on. And it was through uh, people that I had met at FITM through Paul, our teacher. Mm -hmm. He put me in touch with Chrissy, who was the costume designer on hieroglyph. Oh, nice. That's so cool. It really is all about who, you know, like, yeah. All of my jobs pretty much have stemmed from like my first like internship that I took after college. You know, it's because I met that person through that and I met them through that. And it's like a chain, you know, of people I've met just through like one single job. It's true. Very, very true. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for telling us all about that, Kelly. It's been really fascinating to hear about all the perspectives of how people get into our industry, too, because I think that's also like we are hitting people that are obviously in our industry, but we're also hitting a lot of people who totally have no idea what we do. So it's cool to be able to hear both perspectives. Yeah. And it's very like it's very opaque from the outside. Yes. Because I get a, yeah. a lot of people messaging me asking for advice and you know, I, I explain it best I can, but it's really not like a clear process or even just right. like to explain to people like they're like, well, do I need a master's degree? And I'm like, no, you just need to be able to do the job. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's sort right. of the opposite of true. what most industries, you know, tell students. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, not that education true. is bad. Like, I think education is amazing, but it's it can feel very backwards sometimes. Yeah. Very true. I feel left out a lot as a costume, as a theater costume designer specifically that I don't have a master's because so many working costume designers do. And I'm always just like, I have the same skill set. You know, it's just like an extra thing that I didn't do. Um, So it's it's interesting, like what industries that matters and then what industries it doesn't. It's true. Well, and uh, to be honest, where you're working, Sarah, I don't really think it does matter that much. Like as someone who does have an MFA, there's sometimes where I'm just kind of like, I don't, it was like, it became an extra thing. It's certainly not something that's getting me more work. Right. I mean, I shouldn't say that it, it's gotten me some work, but it hasn't gotten me all of my jobs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's probably just more, I mean, more networking and, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, absolutely. Showing people that you that's, that's can still. work hard and, you know, do the work. Right. Yeah, totally. It's, I, I think it, it also is about how well you work with other people, right? We keep talking about collaboration, and that's that's such a huge part of our industry, too, is like it's not just about getting the job done. It's also about getting along with the people you're working with so that they'll want to hire you back because no one wants to work with someone who's horrible to work with, regardless of how <laughs> good your skill is, unless, you know, unless you're really like that far up ab- above and beyond. But most of the time, if if you have a reputation for being that horrible on every job, you kind of start, you start filtering out a little bit. Yeah. yeah I think if you're like really established, you can be a jerk to people and still get jobs. Right. But if you're not yet, then you're if not going to get an Oscar. Back. If you've won an Oscar, you can be a jerk. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I should tell that Otherwise, to, some, to some of the jerks that I've worked with. Like, Excuse me, do you have an Oscar? Then you don't need to yell at me. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. Yeah, I hope you had fun. I did. <laughs> Yay. 
I was just like, oh, it's God, always fun I to talk about movie movies we're so passionate much. about. I was like, I hope I'm not giving like way too much information and that this not makes sense because it's there's definitely just, not. There's so much in this movie to love. It's very dense. <laughs> yes, but worth absolutely worth really um, diving into the nitty gritty of. I think that's the fun of these podcasts too, though. It's like where you really, really do get to kind of dive in deep and take the time to talk about it. I feel like when we have like an hour to talk about two movies, it always feels really rushed. But it's nice to be able to like take our time I, through I, one I'm and really very go in. impressed with how much ground you guys managed to cover in one episode with two things. Like I'm always Thanks. like, how how Thank are they you. being so succinct and <laughs> descriptive? <laughs> Thank you for saying that because we certainly don't feel that. <laughs> no, it's great. It's That's really the best great. feedback we've ever gotten. I'm so thrilled by that. <laughs> I'm leaving this in the episode. <laughs> Especially when half the time we're like, Sarah, I feel like I talked too much. Like, did I cover everything? I don't feel like anybody knows what we're talking about. It's funny because lots of times it'll be like, we'll alternate. Like the one episode, JoJo will talk for 40 minutes and I'll talk for 20 and then we'll switch the next episode. So it's like we <laughs> kind true. of just like fill in the spaces as needed. <laughs> yeah. Very true. But yeah, we but love yes, to Thank nerd you for out. saying that. Thank you for joining us to nerd out about costumes. It's the best. Thank you Absolutely. for having me. You're so welcome. Of um, course. Can you tell our listeners where to find you on the internet if they feel inclined? There's probably, I think, based on discussions, only one place. But tell tell them where that is. <laughs> yeah, I am like sort of taking a break from social media. So really, the only thing I have right now is Instagram, which I periodically update. But a lot of like. <laughs> A lot of my prior work and tutorials and whatnot are still on there for people to go look at. And I respond to questions almost all the time, <laughs> as long as they're not creepy. <laughs> we'll, link, we'll link you in the episode description so that people can go right to you, your okay. profile. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, well, thanks again. This was really successful. Great job, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. And join us next time. Yeah. We have some good movies coming up. Yeah. I'm excited about it. I'm excited. (laughs) All right. That's it. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Costume Plot. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Costume Plot. If you have a question, comment, or a movie suggestion, you can email us at thecostumeplot at gmail.com. Our theme music is by Jesse Tim, and our artwork is by Jojo Sue. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to your podcasts.